Until now, we have been studying mostly quantum uh, theories and physical phenomena, which were discovered a relatively long time ago. So I think maybe the latest uh, theoretical development we talked about, the path integral itself, uh, goes back to the 40s, uh, 1940s. Uh, today, in this video, towards the end of the video, I'm going to uh, tell you uh, about a more recent uh, theoretical development, uh, so-called theory of uh, quantum localization, or more precisely, weak localization. Uh, and I will do so uh, using the main ideas uh, of the Feynman path integral. So I should mention that the full theory of quantum localization is an extremely uh, complicated mathematical theory, and it could be a subject of a separate course, so I don't have time for that, and obviously we don't have the mathematical sort of uh, background to talk about it. But it turns out that some uh, basic ideas behind uh, uh, this phenomenon can be understood using uh, uh, the basic concepts behind the Feynman path integral, which, which comes handy here. So uh, just in a few words, when, what I'm going to be talking about here is the following. So we know that uh, in solid state physics, uh, materials uh, sort of can be divided into roughly two categories, uh, insulators and metals. Uh, they're also semiconductors, but from this perspective, they're much like insulators. So, and if you, what insulators are, if you apply a weak electric field, uh, the electrons uh, which exist inside the material don't move. And so there is no current really in, in response to such a field. So if you think about a piece of wood or something like that, so we uh, obviously understand it's an insulator. It's not going to be a very useful electric component. On the other hand, if we have a metallic uh, system, let's say a piece of copper, and if we apply electric field or voltage, uh, there will be current in response to this electric field. And uh, so uh, this characterizes a, a metal. So in any real material, whether it's an insulator or a metal, uh, there, there are some imperfections, uh, disorder, uh, impurities, uh, dislocations, all kinds of things. And this, uh, in metals, these impurities and dislocations, etc., so these imperfections, they uh, lead uh, to a finite resistance. Okay, and so there, first, first in the next slide, I will tell you about how this resistance comes about. But uh, later on, we will see uh, how the essentially classical theory of transport that uh, applies to most metals at high temperature uh, get modified as you go to lower temperature. And at low temperatures, quantum effects come into play. The wave nature of electrons come into play. And this is very interesting, and it turns out that there, under certain circumstances, you can get complete, uh, completely different behavior at low temperatures. The metals actually would become insulators. And this process of uh, trapping electron due to quantum mechanical effects is called localization. So, of course, uh, it's a very mathematical theory, as I told you, but we'll try to get some idea about where uh, it comes from. But before discussing a complicated quantum theory, let me first talk about the uh, basic, uh, classical, uh, very simple theory of how we can understand uh, electrical transport in a metal. So here, uh, this black dot uh, uh, labels uh, an electron which can move around uh, in a piece of metal. And uh, these red dots here, larger dots, they represent some impurities of, of which uh, the electron can scatter. And that's exactly what it does as it moves around, so it gets uh, scattered by these uh, red uh, impurities, and so the, the trajectory of this electron is this diffusive trajectory, sort of random walk. Of course, there are, it's not just one, there are many, many electrons in the metal, and they all experience this random walk, which in the absence of an electric field just averages out to zero. There is no net current, there is no preferential direction, there is nothing which breaks the symmetry. But now if we, let's say, apply electric field uh, in this direction, uh, the electrons which have a negative uh, charge are going to move in the opposite direction preferentially. They're still going to move around in all directions, but there will be sort of a drift in one particular direction, and this will uh, give rise to uh, a, a current. Now, uh, it turns out that the first theory of this uh, conductivity of this current in the metal was put together back in uh, 1900. And this is what theory is a so-called Drude theory, which is a very simplistic theory that I'm going to explain now. So basically, the Drude model assumed that uh, we can just view the electron as a classical particle, which therefore satisfies the classical equations of motion, the Newton uh, equation. And uh, in the presence of electric field, so the charge, let's say if the charge is Q, so it experiences this uh, force due to the electric field, and these impurities, all these imperfections, he just replaced with the uh, friction force. 
and this friction force uh, was assumed to be proportional to the velocity. Let's say it sort of makes sense if you have a viscous fluid, for instance, and if you put an object and it's going to move in this fluid, so it's going to experience some force, uh, friction, which is proportional, uh, proportional to the velocity, and with a minus sign, of course, and there is some coefficient. So velocity is momentum divided by the mass, so we can write, instead of writing the friction force this way, we can write it as minus P over T, uh, of some tau, which is a time scale which describes momentum relaxation uh, in this uh, process. So, uh, in some sense, you may think about this tau as um, uh, the typical time between uh, collisions for the electron. But in the Druda model, it was just a sort of phenomenological parameter that described friction or momentum relaxation of this electron. And now, what he did, he simply wrote down this uh, um, uh, model. And uh, so, um, of course, we can write the left-hand side of the uh, Newton equation as dp dt. And so uh, the right-hand side, just putting this together, is going to be the electric force and this friction force. And in equilibrium, we demand uh, that there is no acceleration of electrons. So if we sort of, if we, if we take, uh, let's say, a piece of metal, apply some electric field, eventually it's going to come to some sort of steady equilibrium. There is going to be a current, but there's not going to be indefinite in acceleration of electrons. They're going to come to a certain uh, sort of steady state, and this steady state will determine uh, the current. Now, uh, and from here, what we can do, we can just solve for the, for the velocity. So uh, momentum is equal from, from this equation is going to be equal Q uh, times E uh, times tau. And velocity, therefore, is going to be just uh, momentum divided by the mass. And uh, at this stage, what we can do, so uh, we can write the current. So the current is simply the charge the, uh, of the carriers, in this case electrons, times the density of these carriers, how many of those participate in transport, and V is the velocity, which we just determined. And so if we put everything together, we're going to get this expression. So it's going to be this coefficient, which is called conductivity, and uh, times the electric field. So by definition, actually, the uh, Conductivity is the coefficient of proportionality between the current and the electric field. And so this expression, this nq squared tau over m, is the so-called Drude conductivity, <clears throat> which, as you can see, is a purely classical uh, entity. So there is no quantum mechanics here whatsoever. Now, embarrassing thing that I have to admit uh, at this stage is that almost all sort of useful theories of metals, of transporting metals, rely on this Drude equation up to this day. So since for more than 100 years we've been using this equation, and in most cases it actually works fine. But fortunately, well, for our scientists, otherwise it would have been really boring. So if you go to lower temperatures, the uh, situation becomes uh, a little more uh, tricky. And this is because quantum mechanics become, becomes important. So quantum mechanics come into play. And what it means is that in this picture, for instance, what, what, how we can envision the appearance of quantum effects is that Instead of just straight trajectories of classical particles, we're going to have waves bouncing around of, of these uh, impurities. And so uh, these waves are going to interfere with, one, with each other in some sense. So uh, it's going to be the particle is going to interfere with itself. And these quantum interference effects are going to, are going to modify this picture uh, very significantly. So now let us look at the mo electron motion in a metal, in a disordered metal, from a slightly different perspective. Actually, from a completely different perspective, because now we want to explicitly to turn on uh, quantum mechanics. And we will use quantum mechanics, interpretation of quantum mechanics due to Feynman, and ask the question of what is the probability of, uh, uh, for an electron to diffuse uh, from an initial point to a final point F through this forest of impurities. And according to the Feynman, uh, this probability can be written as the absolute value squared of uh, uh, a sum of uh, quantum mechanical amplitudes associated with all possible uh, classical paths, so this diffusive trajectory. And here I'm just showing uh, two such possible trajectories, uh, you know, this blue one and the black one, and these guys are going to interfere with one another. And this interference, uh, so for instance, if I call this trajectory uh, uh, trajectory one, and this is going to be trajectory two, so the interference term, which is uh, which is going to appear due to this uh, from this expression, is going to involve uh, a product of this uh, black exponential e to the power i s one h bar uh, times the uh, blue exponential, which is complex conjugate i s two divided by h bar 
uh, plus its complex conjugate. So all in all, the interference term coming from these two particular trajectories, again, this is just two examples. There are infinitely many such trajectories and infinitely many such terms. But in any case, each of these terms is going to produce this sort of cosine of S1 minus S2 divided by H bar. So this is basically the quantum interference terms. And the terms uh, which don't involve the cross product of different trajectories are classical terms. So in some sense, these are the terms which are responsible for the Drude conductivity, the classical Drude conductivity that we obtained in the previous uh, uh, discussion. Okay. And so now the question of what, are quant what, is, what is quantum mechanics doing, what are the quantum corrections, boils down to figuring out what these terms are, actually. Now, uh, in the beginning of uh, this video, I mentioned something about temperature. I said, well, at high temperature, so these terms don't really matter. At low temperatures, they start to matter. And the reason this is the case is because at high temperatures, what temperature really is, it involves a lot of motion which occurs around these electrons, which are sort of doing their thing, moving around, diffusing around. But there is also, let's say, lattice vibrations, all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, this uh, sort of shaking of the electron disturbs uh, the phases. So in some sense, this is what is called sometimes in quantum mechanical literature, this is called dephasing. So basically here in this expression, uh, whatever theory we're going to be doing, we're going to determine these actions, we're going to assume that phase, quantum mechanical phase, is going to remain constant uh, during, uh, or unperturbed, better to say, during the motion of electron or, uh, along these trajectories. But it turns out that even if we assume that there is no disturbance of the phases and uh, no dephasing, so classical physics in some sense uh, protects itself uh, in that uh, these quantum interference terms uh, tend to cancel each other out and completely disappear from the picture and we'll actually have to search really hard in order to find uh, the situation where they start uh, being uh, essential. And in order to see all this, let me estimate uh, the uh, typical action that appears in this equation. So uh, remember that, uh, well, at this stage, we're just talking about uh, particles bouncing, uh, bouncing around from these impurities, but otherwise, in between each scattering, uh, they, they are free particles. So their energy is essentially just mv squared over 2, the kinetic energy of a free particle. And therefore, in order to estimate the action, we can just say that, uh, well, of the, uh, by, the, uh, by, the, by the order of the, uh, estimate, so it's going to be uh, mv, which is momentum, times another velocity, times dt, which is sort of, so this is going to be the total length of the trajectory, and this is going to be the typical momentum. So we, we can estimate our action on each path uh, as uh, the typical momentum of an electron times the typical length uh, of uh, the trajectory. So now using this estimate, we can also estimate uh, the uh, typical uh, quantum interference terms, which are, which are described by the sum of over all uh, pairs of non-equivalent different trajectories, L1 and L2. Uh, and now instead of the action S, we write explicitly the typical momentum, which by the way is called Fermi momentum divided by H bar times the difference in length between the two trajectories under consideration. Or uh, we can write it equivalently as uh, the cosine, sum over all L1 not equal to L2, uh, cosine of uh, typical momentum uh, times delta L divided by H bar. So it turns out that this uh, argument of the cosine in the typical metal is actually very large. And this is because the typical velocity uh, of electron in a metal is less than a percent of the speed of light, which uh, one hundredth of the speed of light, which still is pretty fast. And therefore the uh, typical Fermi, uh, the typical wavelength turns out to be less than a nanometer, 10 to the uh, minus nine meters, which is uh, uh, usually much smaller than the distance between these red dots here. So I'm just giving you facts. It's not by any means obvious. It doesn't follow from the previous discussion. I'm just giving you certain information. And the bottom line here is that the uh, typical wavelength, in some sense, you may think about electrons really being a wave. And this uh, wavelength is much, much smaller than the distance between these red guys. And so the interference terms are not very important. And how it plays out here is that, so this typical ratio of delta L divided by essentially this lambda is very large and so you have uh, different trajectories contributing to this sum and so you have cosines of different phases completely random phases and cosine as we know is the function which can be uh, positive or it can be negative depending so if this is our cosine of phi and this is phi so it can be positive or negative and so if we completely pick 
uh, this uh, phase is completely in random so the average value of the cosine uh, is going to be zero so the terms uh, with different signs of cosine basically cancel each other out and this is exactly what happens with quantum interference terms and so seemingly uh, classical physics survives and we can just completely forget about this quantum interference phenomenon so fortunately it's not quite the case it's almost the case actually uh, in uh, uh, not very disordered uh, metals in three dimensions but it's not always the case and uh, how uh, the quantum interference terms sort of appear uh, we can see by noticing that there is a very special class of trajectories where this uh, randomization and this uh, cancellation uh, is not, uh, doesn't happen. And these are so-called self-crossing trajectories, which actually one of those trajectories is sort of uh, presented here. So this, you see there is a loop here when an electron can actually travel in the uh, clockwise direction. And this is going to be our path number one. Or it can decide to travel in the opposite direction, counterclockwise direction, in which case it's going to be a path number two. And the two paths are going to have, they're going to be different paths, but they're going to have exactly the same length. And therefore, the quantum interference terms corresponding to these paths are going to survive. This, uh, this phase difference is going to be zero, and uh, these terms are going to play out very significantly. And so this is what we're going to discuss in the second part of this, uh, of this video. Uh, now, um, going back a little bit to physics in order just to get, give you an intuition about what, what, what it has to do with conductivity, so we can sort of uh, can intuitively understand that uh, the easier it is for an electron to move from an initial point to some distant final point, the better this material conducts. Okay, the better it diffuses, the better it conducts. And uh, at the classical level, it is just determined by this Drude conductivity. On the other hand, uh, the easier it for the electron to return to the same point, the, the more often it is sort of goes back and back, so the uh, worse conductor it is. So in some sense, the probability to have this uh, self-crossing trajectories should, uh, in general, by general arguments, reduce the conductivity, and this is exactly what happens in most cases, and therefore it is called uh, so-called weak localization. Basically, it tries to uh, bring the electron back to where it came from, 